Obviously, we're going to talk about veg today. Winston and I are two of, I guess, the self-proclaimed veg heads at Greenland. So yeah. that's pretty much all we talk about. So um, uh, Winston has a lot of experience. I'd say a lot more than I do with veg, but I've been growing them for years, and that's kind of my passion right now. Yeah, we've both been really excited talking about what we're going to try this year and all yeah. the food we're going to grow. Yeah, and I think what I love this year is the... Um, fact that there's, you know, with everything that we're seeing right now in the world, there's this huge renewed interest in edibles and everybody's mm -hmm. calling it, you know, the um, renewal of the victory garden, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's um, great for Winston now because we're really excited about sharing that with everyone. Yeah, so. we're seeing a lot of new gardeners online that are just starting out, trying to figure things out. And, and like, yeah. luckily, there's there's all sorts of other hobbyists out there. There's great great places like Greenland with experts that can help you out with that stuff. And so we just wanted to try to share some of that info and help you have the best success you can with growing some veggies this year. Right. And one of the things I think, you know, when we're doing the 630 Chad Garden Show too on the weekends is we, right now, uh, and on the Facebook plant groups that we follow and are a part of, we see a lot of questions about, okay, so my seeds germinated and now what? Now what? Yeah. Right? They're like, I'm so happy they germinated, but what do I do now? Yeah. And so we wanted to show today, and we also did a quick video on this last week that Greenland will be sharing this week, um, but Winston was going to show kind of the different stages of tomato growth and how you start out with now that that seedling's germinated and has a couple true leaves, what mm -hmm. you would do. Yeah, so these guys here, like I have them in this in this six pack here, so they take up a little less space but still have lots of room for growth. These seedlings are about three to four weeks old. Yeah, we've got a couple questions in. I bought a greenhouse this year and I'm thinking of growing my veggies in there instead of outside. Is this a good idea? Will they taste the same? Yeah, so the question was about growing veggies. They bought a greenhouse and growing veggies in a greenhouse. And Winston actually has lots of success. And they said, will things still will I have success? And will things still taste the same? Yeah, I think the thing to think about in a greenhouse is um, in the daytime, it's going to be a lot warmer than outside. So it can help you extend the season. But if it's not heated at night, it's just as cold as it is at night. So it's if it's freezing out night, outside at night in your small greenhouse, it's also going to be freezing. Um, right. It'll keep a very light frost of like maybe minus one, minus two off. Right. But this time of year especially, like if it goes down to minus seven at night, your greenhouse is going down to minus yeah, seven. Yeah, and I think if you're just starting out, you know, um, someone who's new to it might not be using it for another couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. You might invest in a little th uh, therm thermostat so you can yeah. see what the temperature is. Um, and once it gets warm, however, another thing that's important is venting. Yeah. Venting. So on a hot, hot day, keeping that greenhouse door open. Yeah. The other thing is pollination. Pollination is also a thing too. Uh, when it comes down to anything that needs to be insect pollinated, like your, your cucumbers, your zucchinis, um, your tomatoes need at least some ruffling or some yeah. vibration to get some, some germany, I mean pollination, but you need to make sure for your anything in that sort of squash, pumpkin, cucumber family, that you're doing some hand pollination or, or making sure the bees can get into your greenhouse. Right, so propping that door open or you're becoming the, the bee, right? You're mm -hmm. using that little, you know, craft paintbrush to transfer pollen. When I was in Olds, we've talked about that. That was one of my jobs is growing the huge tomato crops for fruit for market gardens. And so one of my jobs was walking along and ruffling all the tomatoes and shaking yeah. the pollen around, right? Yeah, I've seen some people even like repurposing an old uh, electric, like electric toothbrush. toothbrush. Yeah. And you just vibrate those branches and the way tomato flowers work is they self-pollinate as soon as they're disturbed. So when the bee would go to climb in there, um, he's not actually getting to the pollen, but he's getting nectar and he's making the flower self-pollinate, yeah, basically. Yeah, so that's a good question. So yeah, yeah, and then I guess one more thing to, to think about with the greenhouses is because they are hotter, your cold, cold season crops don't like the greenhouse. So like your carrots, your beets, spinach, uh, most lettuces, there's some heat tolerant right. lettuces, but radishes, things like that that like those, those cold seasons, just direct sow those as soon as, as Outside, the, the yeah. garden's workable because they will go right to seed on you on the indoors. Perfect. Yeah. And so, yeah, just a reminder, that was a great greenhouse question and feel free throughout uh, to uh, interrupt us with your questions because we'd love to interact with you. Yeah. And so back to your little transplant. Yeah, back to the tomatoes. These are about three, four weeks old. They've got lots of true leaves going on. I even could have moved them to a bigger pot sooner, but I was trying to save some space. And then they can go from this, which is like this guy, also a plug, same variety, blush, really tasty striped Roma type. We have lots of these for sale this year. And then you can go to a four inch pot like this and they can finish in this for the year. I'm curious, what is the best medium sweet variety of tomatoes? 
Okay. So someone asked, what is the best medium sweet variety of tomatoes? Okay. Yeah. Um, and we are going to talk about some of our, our favorites. Some of ours are a little more unusual, the ones we really like. Mm -hmm. But I'd say a medium sweet. Yeah, something like blush is quite sweet. But for a medium sweet, go for like a nice red slicing type, like Bonnie's Best, Ace 55, an Italian heirloom, also a nice medium sweet. Yeah. Um, just any of your ones that aren't labeled really sweet are going to be in that nice medium. Right, yeah, sort of and range. it's. I'm glad they said sweet because some of our medium slicers, like Early Girl and Subarctic Plenty, are fantastic producers, but I wouldn't say that they are as sweet as some of the other varieties could be. No, and usually when you want something that like that's your snacking type, your salad type, you also want to go for something coreless. Like Bonnie's Best is really nice and coreless. You can just eat it on a hand. Whereas even your Early Girls, your Subarctics. Once they're later in the season, they're, they got some meat to that core yeah, that I'll, you usually cut out the core. Right, so. and so Bonnie's Best would probably be our number one recommended one, and we're going to have that for sale here. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and talking about greenhouses too, that's a really heat tolerant, super vigorous variety. Right. It's one of the best recommended ones for greenhouses as well. Yes. Yeah, your, your bush type tomatoes, when you go to the greenhouse, sometimes they just exhaust themselves in the extra heat. So that's another right. thing too, thinking about your greenhouse Pick those high vigor, those vining indeterminate tomatoes. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So like I said, you can finish a tomato um, in a four inch pot very easily. It's going to slow yeah. down a little bit towards transplanting, but that's okay. You're not going to end up with like a three foot plant. Um, so you can just bury this as deep as you can. I'm going to pinch off a few of the extra leaves and bury the stem. Make sure my pot's nice and full so there's good airflow around everything. Yeah. And then uh, after a couple weeks you get, or I guess this is just a few days actually after feeding, the green starts coming back into everything. Um, five days later it's almost fully healthy again and then this is a, a 10 days after transplant to a four inch pot and it's beautifully healthy it's soaked up all that nitrogen yeah and so you see as at each stage like at the baby stage you know they're they kind of start to suffer in those cell packs they're getting hungry for nutrients their roots are you know um have are growing out of that soil uh limit and so you'll see when starting seeds at home that's one thing to remember um is that when you are uh, starting seeds indoors, when you're starting in cell packs like this, uh, if I had a lot of room, I would just simply start in these four inch pots. But if you want to grow quite a few plants, you do want to start in those cell packs because then it gives you that room that as we get closer to being outdoors, you can then transplant to pots that take up more room, but it gives you the ability to start a large number of plants. Mm -hmm. And even though you see them starting to, to whimper when they're getting transplanted, look how quickly after transplanting that yellowing goes away, they start to green up, and then they thicken up right away. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few questions actually came in. Uh, Jeremy asks, are there benefits to having different tomato varieties or other vegetable varieties in close proximity to one another for cross-pollination? Hmm. Yeah, so when it comes to cross-pollination, I think the question here is, is there, is there a benefit to having other varieties nearby? Um, so this would be a, a bit of the idea of maybe companion planting a little right, bit. So yeah. something like a tomato is, is self-fertile. It doesn't need to outcross. You right. just need the bees to have access to it. Or even uh, like a nice wind will pollinate your tomatoes. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to something like your squashes, those do need to cross between flowers. If you have nearby plants um, that are attracting more pollinators, you might want to plant some flowers to bring in some, some bees. Right, and one of my favorite things um, that's so easy to plant and readily available at all the garden centers and rather inexpensive, is just even a little four inch pot yep. of cat mint, yep. not catnip, cat mint. It blooms all summer long. I have it growing beneath my Evans cherry tree and there's not a day in the summer that it's not full of big fat bumblebees mm -hmm. uh, moving around and so it's fantastic for pollinators. So even just adding some of those, even sowing some wildflowers that attract pollinators yeah. in and around your veg. Yeah, anything that's a little more showy because vegetables that need pollination definitely need those bees coming in but the bees might not see those flowers from far away. So like your marigolds, your nasturtiums, snapdragons, things that are showy and that the Bright. bees love bring, yeah. bring them in yeah yeah when is the latest to plant tomato seeds indoors okay i'm glad you asked this because we were going to touch on this today yes. uh when is the latest to plant tomato seeds indoors and actually we're kind of past we're that kind point of past that, yeah. so for the best success because we don't we can't ever predict how long our season's going to be here in alberta last year we had a lot of rainy days not mm -hmm. as much sun as we would typically want and not as much heat so with tomatoes 
I would say at this point, plan on purchasing finished plants this year. We ideally want to start about 10 weeks out with tomatoes for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but we did, I'm glad you asked that because we did want to touch today on things that it's too late for tomatoes. It's too late for peppers. Definitely too late for peppers. Definitely too late for peppers. But right now there are still some great things to start indoors and you're right on time. Mm -hmm. And that would be le lots of leafy greens. So your lettuces, your kales, uh, things like um, uh, the pak choy, bok choy. Yeah, anything else in that cabbage brassica family. You want to get a good six to eight weeks head start on plants of them. And for, for those, that's you can get those out in early May. They're frost tolerant. So you start now, you have that five, six week head start and you're, yeah. you're perfect. Yeah, so cabbage, uh, cauliflower, uh, broccolis. There are still herbs you can start indoors. Yeah, lots of herbs. As long as they have a good three, four week head start, they're going to be big enough plants to be able to survive that transplanting and you still get a, a benefit over late transplanting. And then your warm growing herbs, like, like basil in particular, you want to get that started now and then not put it out until it's way past those cold nights because it will get stunted. At on least you. a week or two after May long weekend, mm -hmm. right? So if that's our planting out, uh, if you guys are reading seed packages of what to start right now, um, so right now we're probably looking at about six weeks out from May long weekend. So anything that is like, you know, that four to six week window, you could start lots of melons, people Still could start perfect. zucchini, squashes. Um, you could get an early crop of turnips or Swiss chard even. Those are like very easy to start. And then once they're just a couple inches tall, set them out early May and they're, yeah. they're ready to go. Those are great things. These all, all these things we're mentioning are really easy germination too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I often try to grow the palm-sized cantaloupe varieties, but without much luck. Has anyone ever grown these successfully here? Are there any tips or tricks? Yeah, I've grown the melons fairly successfully. The biggest thing with them is they like warm soil and they're heavy feeders. Unfortunately, our soil doesn't warm up until well into June, mm -hmm. but you can get around that by either using black plastic mulch on your soil, almost creates like a greenhouse, warms it up fast. Or um, I like to just grow mine in, in pots. Like, I was going to say, I'll take like yeah. a 10-gallon black nursery pot so it heats up in the sun. I'll put it in the sunniest spot I have. And uh, I'll put two or three of those smaller, like your far no north, your rock gem melon, something like that, that is going to ripen faster because it's smaller. And they, they grow like crazy. I put a good couple handfuls of, of steer manure in that pot with yeah. them, and they just grow like crazy. Peppers are also another thing that people struggle with when we have cold rainy seasons. And that is one thing I would say again, too. If you're not having success in the ground, grow them in black pots. Those pots heat up so much, mm -hmm. right? And they really w love a warm root system. So that's, you know, another thing, like any of the, pe the peppers, the melons, things like that. Um, and with the melons too, look at the um, days to maturity on the package, mm -hmm. right? When you're purchasing. Yeah, because you can even get some full-sized musk melons and watermelons that are that 75 days to finish. We can do that as long as your soil is warm from the start. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What? is or are the best cucumbers to plant? Okay, cucumbers, everybody has their favorite, and there's obviously different kinds. So yeah. whether you're wanting the long English, whether you're wanting the snackers, if you're wanting for pickling or the bush ones with the little spines, yeah. I'm picky about the ones with spines <laughs> because Brady loves the little muncher ones. Muncher yes. is mine and Allison's favorite because it's like the ones, you know, you buy the bags in the grocery like stores. Baby cukes. The little yeah. baby cukes, and they're ready to go. Um, yeah. Muncher is one you can get by seed. Yeah. Usually you can get it finished as well. Yeah, muncher, patio snackers like that as well. Yes. Um, there's a couple other of those nice, like, quick eat little varieties. Long English itself does quite well here. You can eat all. One of my favorite eat all cucumbers, it's like a nice full side, is Tasty Green. It's available from the Mackenzie seed line. I plant those every year. Uh, they do great in a greenhouse or outside. Right. Um, and then, like, when it comes to making pickles, I think a, a, a fan favorite and a lot of our staff favorite is homemade pickles. Um, it's just that's a, a variety we can get via seed yeah here. via seed yep. and it's just it's crazy like and cukes are so something you can start indoors a lot of the i would say really experienced babas at the community garden plot <laughs> i garden at um swear by uh planting them directly in ground yeah. um i do find that transplants if you're not there to babysit them every day um we could have a super hot day and they're like sulking and then we can have a cold night and they're dead or sulking yeah. so i would suggest if you want to get them started early indoors one thing i like to do is use the little peat pots mm -hmm. um 
and reason being is you don't have to take the cucumber seedlings out of the peat pots. You plant that pot right in the ground. They do not like their roots to be disturbed. So no. yeah. either so the peat pots are in the ground. Something that like minimizes that transplanting or sometimes I'll do like, I'll take a bigger pot, I'll over sow them so that when I move them, they're not pot bound. Because also if they get to that point where they're pot bound and stunted, you're losing three weeks uh, which you like say you for started, them to get so the settled, three weeks early yeah. doesn't make a difference because the three week adjustment period right. right I've also had good luck using um you can cut up toilet I mean toilet paper is in short supply right now but, but you the can, rolls are fine you can use the toilet paper <laughs> rolls and yeah. plant right in that and then it's basically bottomless and it's usually mushy by the time you go to plant plop that in the ground right easy transplant yeah yes mm -hmm. good yes okay yeah. Okay. Hey. All right. So um, we talked, we showed you a little bit of transplanting and that uh, like works for everything you're transplanting. Once your seedlings are starting to outgrow that cell pack, you can move them up, you know, into a little bit bigger pot and then a bigger pot before going outside. Mm -hmm. Lots of the lettuces and stuff you'll be starting now and kale, you actually could leave in that six pack until you plant and out. And your herbs as so, well. Yeah. Um, but we also wanted to touch on some of our um, tomato favorites. Yes. So Some of our favorite the first one here. is, uh, it's both of ours, uh, but you save your seed for it, yellow pear. Yeah, yellow pear. Uh, we have a lot of those for sale this year as well. It's just like a nice kind of, almost like a grape-sized tomato. It's a cute little pear shape, uh, golden, very sweet. Yes. Um, but also got some good texture to it. Like it's not mushy. It's, it's got a pop to it yeah, when you bite into it's it. It's got a good pop to it. And those plants are one of the most vigorous tomatoes you'll ever grow, like easily eight feet tall eight in a year. Eight to nine feet, so stake them well. Stake them. I tied mine up the side of my house last year. And uh, yeah, it's just a really nice, easy to grow yellow pear and an, and an heritage, so a heritage, so you can save your seeds from them if yes. you want. Yes, yeah, I absolutely love that one. Do you have any experience or tips with hydroponic vegetable gardening? Yeah, so hydroponic vegetable gardening, my experience is in a massive greenhouse at Olds College. Yeah. So usually hydroponics, um, people might use to start some stuff indoors. Mm -hmm. Usually we don't use it on a big scale mm -hmm. uh, for larger gardens here. I've done a bucket grow system in my yard with peppers and I tried melons before I accidentally drowned them. But I think I'd say the biggest thing with hydroponics is don't cheap on on your nutrients. Hydroponic nutrients are formulated for hydroponics and they'll help you a lot along the way. And invest in something to test your pH with because pH is everything. It can change within a day depending on how fast your plant is growing and you can lose your whole right. root system and stuff. So. Yeah, with the thing we have to remember with uh, growing in soil, nutrients are already readily available in the soil if mm -hmm. we don't choose to feed additionally. In uh, hydroponics, you're solely responsible for those nutrients. Yeah. And when Winston mentions the, you know, if we see salt build up in a, in a garden or a container garden, we leach the soil. Yeah. We water and it flushes out. It's very difficult to change that to go back to where you were in a hydroponic system. Yeah, so read up quite a bit on the nutrients. Yeah, there are some really nice like self-watering, like look at like global bucket systems that use like a peat-based soil and kind of a hydroponic media as well. Those are really nice. They're way more forgiving. They'll balance your pH for right. you. But yeah, yeah, yeah do some research and, and make sure you have like the basic equipment because it's not something you can just green thumb it through. Right. Yeah. Yeah, needs a little bit of research behind it. A little yeah. bit, yeah. So yeah, yellow pear yeah. being one of my favorites. Uh, Tina also loves garden peach. I love garden peach. One. So this one I had purchased seed for last year from Baker Creek Seeds. And then when we went to order this year, it wasn't available. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness Winston saved seed from every tomato he grows. <laughs> and so he had saved, I had given him some garden peach plants last year. Yeah. And he had saved some seed from it. Lots of seed, actually. Lots of seeds, So actually. what I think is wonderful is we're going to be able to share those. Uh, we're going to have them available for sale in the greenhouse this spring. So garden peach is just as you think it is. And I urge you to go. Google it. Um, it is a beautiful kind of medium-sized tomato, mm -hmm. very vigorous. We got lots off of each plant, and I'm not kidding you. It has peach fuzz, it's got fuzz on it. On it's it, got yeah. fuzz. It's like a and wild so type, a little bit. Almost. It's yeah. So it's this beautiful kind of golden yellow with peach coloration, like a sh peach shoulder to it, and then it has that fuzz. But it's not fuzzy like a peach where you it no. actually rubs or, or washes off but it's beautiful and the taste taste is, really is amazing it's got a sweet juiciness to it it's yeah. just now it's absolutely my I, favorite i even picked some of them even a little bit green and they were really great in like a fresh pico or salsa like when they still yeah. had a bit of crunch because they're they're sweet enough that even when they're just under ripe there's sugar yeah in them, they're so. wonderful yeah and then we'll talk we'll just finish up quick before more questions about our last two faves yeah my second 
favorite tomato. Another one I've grown for years is black cherry. It's a, it's a small cherry tomato. Again, crazy vigorous like yellow pear. A nice uh, mid-sized grape tomatoes, yeah. I'd say. And it's just, it's loaded. It's one of those plants that'll get six, seven feet tall as well. And you're just like... Buckets uh, every day. Yeah, yeah, and they also, they're a fairly firm tomato. So like I, I will harvest mine all at the end and I'll be eating them well into October as they ripen. Like yeah. They, they ripen well off the vine. Too, yeah, so. it's a great one. I've grown that one too. And then the last one I was going to mention uh, that Winston got seed for, so again, we'll have this one available for sale, uh, is the sweet pea red currant. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you think currant. It's the size of a pea or a currant. But what I love about them is the pop. So when you put them in your mouth, they pop like a, like a pea. Um, and they're super sweet and tasty. Mm -hmm. What I love though is they are born on these really long trusses, so probably like 20 to 30 little uh, berry-shaped uh, tomatoes on each tr uh, truss. They look gorgeous on a little charcuterie yeah, board because you just thing. lay, you cut the whole tr truss and just lay it out on the plate. Mm -hmm. um, and, or throw them in a little bag. The kids, Brady loved this one. He's not a big cherry tomato fan, but this one he loved because it wasn't mushy. It's got a real pop. Yeah, and it makes like a great salad garnish because of that. I've like baked it on flatbreads and stuff yes. too. It's, it's so good. Just like an, it, it's like the flavor of like a, a bigger tomato, but in this tiny little one. Yeah, so. they're, they're amazing. Yeah, so that's just some of our favorites that we'll have for this year. Mm -hmm. How do I prevent blossom end rot? All right. Yeah, so blossom end rot is always either an overfeeding issue during um, your fruit ripening, so too much nitrogen, you can back off on that nitrogen once your tomatoes start to set fruit, um, or it's a calcium deficiency. Right. Yeah, so that is that can also be remedied by planting with a bone meal, which is a slow release uh, source of calcium, or feeding later in the summer with something like a calcium magnesium product. Yeah. Right, yeah, and so remember too that blossom end rot occurs not just in tomatoes, but it's very common in zucchinis, yes, uh, yeah. sometimes cukes. Mm -hmm. But why we one of the reasons we see it too is, and that ties back to the nutrients, is um, inconsistent watering, right? Yes. So we don't, especially in containers, we don't want to see the container or dry out excessively and then you you go oh and you panic and you soak it mm -hmm. so what is very important and I say this to a lot of the customers that come in the store as I say I know it sounds a little odd but try and pick the same time every day to water your especially your container grown tomatoes so mm -hmm. you know what maybe it's your five minutes after work to come and unwind be out in the yard and water and um, that way you always ensure there's consistent moisture and it's mm -hmm. not thoroughly drying out and then being watered. Yeah, and if you find your pots are drying on crazy fast, like maybe a layer of mulch is what you need, like some wood chips or leaves from last fall, that can help temper that cycle, keep that even moisture, keep that even yeah. supply of food, and that'll help you avoid things like cracking and stuff like yes, that Yes, cracking too, so. is, yeah. And so the other thing too I would say is those weekend warriors that might be out at the lake lot, um, what I love is the plant nanny. And so it's a ceramic watering spike. I use it in my containers because I have quite a few tomatoes in containers on a hot back deck, is those spikes, you can fit a two liter pop bottle on it and it will ensure your plants are watered while you're away. And those mm -hmm. pop bottles in a, you know, say 18 inch pot will last for like four to five days um, of me being away and not watering. Yeah, those are so, very handy. Yeah. Yeah. Can you write the list of veggies that don't like to grow inside? Oh, oh, well, I have to say if you have enough light, you can grow anything inside. Mm -hmm. There are things that appreciate those cool nights which you just can't provide inside. Like if you're trying to grow radishes to finish or yes. some lettuces, they're probably just going to bolt bolt on you inside because they want those nights that are more towards 10 degrees, not 20 degrees. That's right. So unless you are able to, if you're growing somewhere in a room that you can drop that temp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but other than that, yeah, I would say definitely those ones that like the cooler temps, kales and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people do have success with them, but yeah, you would want to ensure. And for flavor too, truly that cold, those cold evenings, yeah. play a lot in the role of flavors. All so. your cold season veggies, when they get those cold nights, their defense against frost is putting more sugar into their leaves yeah. and that makes them taste way better. Yeah. yeah, that's why I leave my carrots, a lot of the carrots in the ground and well into October, mid to end of October. Yeah, they sweeten right yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is it okay to start seeds in cardboard egg containers? And if so, can the bottom be cut off and placed directly into the ground? Thanks. 
Yeah, I'd say yeah. you could probably have luck with those. You just don't want to make sure they're not being waterlogged. Like, I would maybe even still poke some drainage holes in them. Yeah, and I would say it depends in those cardboard egg cartons how, um, what you're starting in them. You wouldn't start larger things like tomatoes, peppers, uh, et cetera, in there. It would be great for smaller greens mm -hmm. uh, and things like that, but it's not going to be good for beans or things like yeah, that. And yeah, and i when you go to plant it, a lot of those paper pots and stuff, even if they're meant to biodegrade in a season, just tear the sides open and that lets the roots out yeah. faster because a lot of times we'll see roots circling in there and it slows your plants. Right, yeah, because those cardboard egg cartons can be a little bit thicker then and won't break down as readily as the peat pots. Like a peat pot, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so um, we're going to get on to some uh, really unique stuff that you and I have started from seed this year. Yes. But just to mention first that uh, beyond the weekly podcast that we're doing uh, at Greenland, we also have been doing a lot of video content to stay connected with you guys. So be sure to, to visit our YouTube channel, um, Greenland Garden. Um, Tyler's put a lot of content on there recently, like mm -hmm. the transplanting video with you. Yeah. Uh, Bob did some uh, tropicals, top tropicals for purifying the air. Yes, yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to produce a lot of great, like little shareable content that you can get this great information and, and let everybody know about. Yeah, it, right? yeah, and so, you know, beyond our really like full feature length uh, videos, we're <laughs> trying to do a lot of shorter ones too, so that you've mm -hmm. only just got five minutes in between, you know, online schooling and uh you know trying to do your work from home you can uh, catch those little snippets of videos yeah yeah two lightning questions for you before we go into conversation. sure two quick questions yeah uh, i have zone five i have a zone five peach tree that i planted two years ago and it actually came back last year is it is this rare or am i just lucky um so zone sweet. five peach tree sweet. they planted and it came back are they lucky yeah I, lucky is a <laughs> uh, I'd say lucky is a good word for it, uh, but you can find zone five microclimates in the city very easily. Like yeah. I just visited one of my friends yesterday picking up some budwood from some apples. Yeah, and he has two zone five peaches and some sweet cherries actually, but he picked the perfect microclimate in his yard. I'd say something like a test winter two years ago, you're very lucky that that didn't die on. Uh, but that, that's awesome, definitely. You should post about that online, get, get a blog going. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know years ago we sold a lot of uh, dwarf um, selections of apricots and peaches, nectarines, uh, and what people were doing is actually growing them as in a, a container yeah. and then bringing it into a garage where it was cool over winter to have a dormancy, mm -hmm. and they had great success with them. Just not sure how much you're ever going to get bounty-wise. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You might get a couple novel peaches, and that would be really That'd cool. That would still be cool. It might like, be the start of a great breeding program yeah, or something. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. You still might have to go to the grocery store to get your peaches for your pies. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, but something to snack on. And was there another question there? Yeah, one last one. Maybe can jump back into yep. the Every year I have a problem with the ants in my greenhouse where I grow only tomatoes and peppers. They're in the soil in raised boxes. I can't get rid of them. Can they actually ever be damaged to the tomatoes or the roots? So ants love raised planters and raised boxes because they drain so well. They don't like it when there's moisture. I know last year a lot of ants moved onto the ground into my planters. At low levels, they're not going to do much more damage than biting you and bothering you. Right. At really high levels, or if they can't find another food source, they will start to eat at the roots of your plant. Um, right. So it, it just kind of keep an eye on them. Something yeah. like diatomaceous earth can be really good in controlling them. And, and it's organic. Organic. Yeah. It's food safe. It'll also feed calcium for your tomatoes. Yeah. So. The one thing about raised gardens too, like to remember that the reason there also could be a great number of ants is rotting wood and wet wood. They, they like that. love that. It's like heaven to them. So just be cautious about that. It could be possibly be that that they're after. But like Winston said. It's not that often that we see them being that huge detriment to plants. Yeah. Um, the, the only time I see it really a problem usually is if they decide to move all the dirt out of your plant or onto the yeah, ground, and then your, right? your roots are floating in all these air pockets, which is not great. But if you just kind of, like, you might want to Even disturbing the soil quite often really annoys them, and they'll often move on to the neighbor's house. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, because yeah. they don't like, they like setting up home and hanging out there for years. They don't like disturbing, like you disturbing mm -hmm. it, so. Yeah, even a really good deep water, if you let it dry, get to the dryer side, give them a really good deep water, they might be like, oh, this isn't a good place to live anymore. Yeah, this is, van it rains too much here, we're moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, any more questions coming in there, Tyler? Not right now. Oh, not yet. Okay, Kay. we got well, a bit you, more content. Yeah, Yeah. you want to talk about some of our favorite 
products for yeah. growing edibles. Some of our favorite fertilizers here for, for growing the edibles. Um, one of my favorites, because you can't really overdo it, is your sea kelp concentrates. They come in a, a few brands. I'm going to toss this to Tyler. We'll see if he catches it. Yep, okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a very low number. Like if you look at it, it's like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So this is something you can mist all the time as a foliar feed. You can do right. a drench once a week. But it's just... It's not about your macronutrients, your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It's about all your micros. It's derived from, from kelp, which sit in the ocean and absorb all of these different minerals Absolutely. and metals. And it, it just keeps things so healthy and green. Yeah, and one thing about kelp, and so I use that all the time because at our community gardens, we use organic only. Mm -hmm. And so what I also love about kelp is when you're growing seedlings indoors, mix it up a weak solution in a spray bottle and you can foliar feed with yes, kelp. Yeah. Whereas with synthetic fertilizers, we're always wanting to soak mm -hmm. that region uh, of the soil, right? So the plant is taking it up. Liquid kelp plants will take in uh, through, very like, available, through yeah. the leaves. Um, and then the other thing um, about it is kelp has an amazing ability um, to defend against diseases. Yeah. So it is wonderful if you're growing the zucchinis, uh, even cucumbers in the gardens, to mist that foliage with that. It's a natural defense against powdery mildew, which mm -hmm. is prevalent in rainy years. Yeah, and it's something that's really so. great as a foliar feed in the garden too. Like when I see my tomatoes are getting tired in August, I give them like a foliar drench of kelp and they're happy for another month and they get a bunch more fruit on yes, them. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's a fantastic one. It's yeah. just so easy to use. Organic certified, so that's nice too. We have another organic certified product here. It's miracle Grow Performance Organics. Uh, this is for edibles and specifically your fruiting ed edibles. It's very high on the potassium. <laughs> <laughs> end of the range. Uh, so that's going to help later on when things start to flower or are supposed to be starting to flower and setting fruit. That potassium helps increase your bud count. So more flowers, more tomatoes, uh, and also helps increase fruit retention. Like it tells the plant, okay, you've got enough food, hold on to those. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so we talked a little bit about this um, on the radio show on Sunday when people called in. And for those of you who haven't listened, tuned in on a Sunday, we're on 630 Ched AM radio from 9 to 11 each Sunday. Um, and they asked, well, what would you start with? Like, what would be your fertilizer regimen mm -hmm. throughout the growing season for edibles? And we said to start it would be like a root booster. Yeah, like a root booster, a 10 52, 10 something high phosphorus. Root boost is also nice because it has some kelp extracts in it with those growth formulas that help your plants just like have right. some good vigor. So anytime you transplant things, your root boost, high phosphorus, 10 52, 10 is yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, and then after that, we you could move to either, uh, to like a 15 30 15, mm -hmm. a triple 20 throughout the season. Yeah, you just, for your seedlings, you want to keep things, you want to have a good supply across the board of those three numbers. Yeah. So something fairly balanced or the, the 15 30 15. Right, and nice. then to finish off, like we said, that edibles one, you know, the miracle Grow Organics that has that high potassium mm -hmm. is a great choice. Yeah, and for people who don't like mixing up fertilizers, I also grabbed this Dr. Earl Earth extract. We have these pre-mixed ones this year, and this is really nice. It's just ready to use out of the bottle. It's a 322, it's a maintenance fertilizer. Um, and you can just, like what your tomatoes are looking a little hungry, you can squirt a squirt of that into each pod on your windowsill and they'll green up right away for you. It's all natural, also organic certified. Uh, so you can use that on anything you're gonna eat. Yeah. Absolutely easy to use. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Go ahead, Ty. So uh, first things first, our chef Catherine is watching. Catherine. Wonderful. Hey, Catherine. <laughs> um, we've got a question that's kind of been answered, but when is a good time to start my tomatoes? What's the best variety for a beginner with zero experience? Yeah, like we said, it's it's basically too late for tomatoes. Like I think the latest ones we started here, even growing under twenty four hour grow lights, was about three weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so. You could probably still get away with a very, very short season bush tomato, maybe, like some of your micro ones. But uh, at this point, it's going to be a lot of, I don't want to say wasted effort, but it's going to be a lot of effort to get a very late tomato crop, yeah. if anything. So and without knowing, again, how long the season's going to be, we want you to be successful. And so we would suggest for this year, starting with finished plants mm -hmm. uh, from the garden centers. And then next year, if you're starting, you're going to start you know, uh, again, that 10 weeks out before yeah. planting. Well, and, and one kind of fun hack at home that actually works on like some of these videos on the internet is if you buy a tomato plant and it's getting those suckers that you're supposed to pinch off, that's mature tissue already. They'll root in a glass of water and then you have another plant and it skips that like eight weeks of seedling phase. So right. you could even just get one plant and then have 
three by the time you plant Pull those suckers so, off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, so what would we say our top maybe three beginners are in it? Again, what we always ask someone when they come into the group veg house mm -hmm. is, well, what are you using the tomatoes for? Are you wanting snacking cherries? Mm -hmm. Are you wanting slicers? Hi, Jersey. Hey, Jersey. Hi. <laughs> um, or are you wanting uh, like big beef steaks? And so for beef steaks, just go with a, a, big, a, beef, a beef steak. steak it's big called beef. a beef steak, yeah, right? Like, go, don't go for your bush. Like if you're just a beginner growing tomatoes, don't go for your bush types because uh, if you stunt them, that's it. That They lose their vigor. Right. Go for your, your vining types, the ones that say indeterminate. So go for your big beef your beef steak versus your bush beef steak. Right, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then medium, I would say, a lot of people, again, do have a lot of success with, um, I would say super fantastic. Super fantastic, Is a fantastic yeah. <laughs> one for mid. And then um, Bonnie's Best. Bonnie's Best, for sure. And Early Girl, too. Honestly, yeah. I do love Early Girl. Early Girl is just super productive. So I actually, I love it for, for slicing and quartering into salads. Mm -hmm. That's what I would use that one. It's very productive. And then cherries... Again, the possibilities are endless. For reds, I have to say it's still Sweet 100 or Sweet yep. Million. They're just incredibly productive. You're picking a little sandwich snacker bag a day off each plant. Mm -hmm. So for me, that I love those two. And for yellow pear, yeah, oh, so just, productive. You can't go wrong with those. Yeah. I even just stuck them in the ground and let them grow across the ground because I was too lazy to stake them. And they, they even hold their fruits up off the ground. Yeah. They're nice and clean. The it, cherries are, are, are very easy for people to grow. And you know what? I find that too. I always go back to this when we're teaching veg classes. Grow what your family's going to eat. Yeah. Um, I grew one year pounds and pounds of habanero peppers. And the only person who will eat them is Chris Burback. And he ate like three of them. And I had probably in the end 75 peppers which I gave away which is yeah. fine but um, if you're if you have a uh, small space to grow in mm -hmm. only grow what your family's gonna eat so if you find you won't eat a lot of big beef steaks mm -hmm. and you don't use ca uh, romas for canning or anything then just grow the cherries okay, and maybe cherries, the smaller yeah. slicers mm -hmm. yeah sure. I have lots of strawberry plants in a raised bed but very little berries how can I improve my crop Okay, strawberries in a raised bed. Yeah, so it depends on the variety of your strawberries. Some are ever bearing, they will bear all throughout the season. And then some are just a June bearing, so it might be just the variety. They get one heavy crop in June and a few stragglers yep. afterwards. Yeah, and, and make sure to, um, in the raised bed, depending on the soil, make sure it's not too rich in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to be adding in a lot of compost or manure every year for those guys. You'll get lots of leaves and less fruit. Yeah, yeah. and remember that, yeah, and so make Make sure too that you know if you haven't fertilized in a while maybe you do try and switch to something like a 15 30 15 to give them a bit of that phosphorus a good boost. boost but remember true strawberries like when they're growing we've got the parent plant that we plant and then they do send out babies mm -hmm. or runners every year the parent plant does after a couple of years get quite tired, tired she's like crowded. all of us mums at home right now homeschooling mm -hmm. she's done <laughs> so um you can actually keep those babies cut mom and the babies away from each other and the mm -hmm. parent plant can be discarded because mm -hmm. you've now got all those little babies that are now going to grow mature and fruit right mm -hmm. yeah well and there's something too like in commercial production those crowns are divided almost every year so even if they're not tired they're crowded and you can right. lift them up and pull each little growing point apart replant and it's going to have space to breathe eat produce fruit for yeah, yeah absolutely so division is a great thing too they do strawberry patches are one of the things that need a bit of renewal mm -hmm. right every for couple sure. years yeah without using a physical barrier how can i keep my dog out of my vegetable containers i love growing tomatoes but i know the leaves are poisonous right <sighs> Yeah. For dogs, yeah, I really, I honestly think with persistent pets, physical barriers are truthfully the only... Might be your only option. Only option, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, you know, whether all the pots, you try and line them up in against a wall and there's some chicken wire, you know, like at a three foot height. But yeah, it's, it's, it is tough if they're not responding to anything, anything training wise, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there are some like pet out products and stuff like that but it, it varies from animal to animal some of them don't mind it some of them <sighs> yeah like, a lot of people say it. that get off my garden which is kind of like a citronella or something based it's oils right mm -hmm. um it has a menthol scent to it 
They do say that works, so you could try Get Off My Garden. It's like a green gel that you would scatter mm -hmm. at the base of the plants. You could attempt that, but then I think other than that, kind of physical barrier is your only yeah. option. Get a nice chicken wire right. fence. Yeah. At what point do you need to put your vegetables in bigger pots after you've started them? Mm -hmm. So like a good rule of thumb before anything gets kind of hungry or stunted at all is when you can start to see roots trying to peek out the bottom of your pots. Um, so like something like these, I just lifted one earlier and it wasn't quite ready. They could probably sit for another few weeks. And as soon as I see roots climbing out the bottom, that's when I know it wants some more space. Yeah, and you can always gently, if you want, mm -hmm. um, you give a little push on the bottom and see how this guy's popping out. But his soil is starting to come away. Um, the roots aren't holding it the together. The roots aren't holding it together. It should come out in a nice column. If it doesn't, you just tap him back down and you know that even in another week, you, could, you would know that would be ready because the soil almost stayed together. Mm -hmm. So also to remember that um, if you're starting to see a great deal of yellowing, um, this guy's a like little yellow. Guy. <laughs> so he was quite, um, those little seedlings before Winston transplanted them in their cell pack were looking quite purple and yellowish. Hungry. And they're like, okay, we are tired of this house. We need to move out. So that's a really good sign. But even just popping them out of that, that's a really good test. Yeah, and then the other thing is like some people might be starting multiple seeds in a pot or a cell pack and they're wanting to separate those. Right. The general rule of thumb, and it, it works for pretty much everything but some of the most delicate things, is wait till you see those first set of true leaves. So you'll have your little seedling leaves which are round or long and skinny, and then when you have the first leaves that start looking like the actual plant, that's when you can gently tease those apart, put them in their own pot. Good tip, yeah. yeah. Good tip, yeah. Um, and just a reminder that, um, so some of the stuff we've talked about today, all of that new stuff in that, um, is the new veg and tomatoes. Those guys will be ready once we hit the, the se uh, growing season and we're almost ready to plant outside. Mm -hmm. We do have select things available right now for sure. We have yeah. some tomatoes ready for all the early birds, lots of fresh herbs. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, it's still tropical plant season because... There's still snow on the ground and everybody wants some trops for inside. Some greenery, yeah. Um, and we are doing curbside pickup. So you can either, um, you can call into the store, you can go online to greenlinegarden.com and mm -hmm. check out our curbside pickup page. Yeah. There's um, lots of content on the page and we welcome you to call us anytime mm -hmm. um, at the garden center. We're here for your questions if you're seeding right now. Yeah, We're if, here if you really want to get some soil and start some kale inside. Yeah, if you're absolutely overwhelmed with the amount of seeds there is to choose from and you're not sure what you can yes. plant right now, we can pick you our favorites, like things we've grown before. Like There's a lot of great veggie gardeners here. There's a lot of great veggie gardeners and what I love is like even ones that I haven't tried, like Allison and Winston have introduced me to Jester lettuce, which is yeah. this beautiful green lettuce with speckled little spots on it and mm -hmm. so that's a new one to try but yeah we do we can we're able to choose like the best varieties that will give you the most success mm -hmm. in our growing region yeah for, for sure. sure yeah good um so we just have about 10 minutes left and so again uh feel free to chime in with your questions and that um a reminder that uh sunday joe and i will be on six thirty chat again mm -hmm. uh sunday morning so we'll be talking more about veg and seeds. I think Joe is going to probably start talking about perennials. For sure, because yeah. Because he's we're getting only antsy. A few weeks away from perennials, or a couple weeks away from perennials. Coming yeah, in. a lot of people are wondering, um, you know, kind of the timing with garden centers right now. And um, I've said this on the, the garden show. Um, you know, it's a new world for us, mm -hmm. and no, just know that your garden centers and greenhouses are there for you. Mm -hmm. They still are growing everything you need. Uh, if they're getting it to you in a different way. That's just getting it to you in a different way, but they're there for you this year. And mm -hmm. so perennials, I would say, will probably start to arrive in a couple weeks. We right now already have some annuals. If you, we always have those um, early birds out there who mm -hmm. want just to bring a geranium home. Something they want to bring something to brighten up. Our Thumbergia vines are looking super they're happy gorgeous. right now. Yeah. So if you wanted to give grandma geranium for Easter instead of a hydrangea or an Easter lily, mm -hmm. something that'll last longer. We've, we've already got some stuff and we're gonna keep updating that curbside pickup page for us um, uh, for every single day for you guys. Any tips for pumpkins? Pumpkins, yeah. So I actually wanted to touch on the whole curcubit family, like your squashes, your pumpkins, your, your zucchinis. Um, just don't start them too early. 
they, they will stunt in pots. They will get a little stressed on you and then you lose that time recuperating. Again, heavy feeders, plant them with a good shovel full of composted manure in every hole. Um, they like warmer soil, so utilize that black mulch or planting in hills or raised rows, raised beds. Your pumpkins especially um, like very warm soil, so you could be yes. planting them out once frosts are done mid-May, but if you wait two weeks, you're going to skip those cold nights that might stunt them too, and you'll probably have a better crop. You know yeah, I mean? absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, it's very easy to start your pumpkins, um, like, early mid-May in a tray that you set outside for the day, and then just drop them in the ground uh, when it is actually warm at the end of May. Yeah. Um, one thing I will say is maybe we should talk a little bit about what should not be started indoors. Yes. <laughs> right? So I, we do also see some... They're not fails, but they're misunderstandings as to what yeah. can be started indoors. Uh, right. Your legumes generally don't love transplanting, and they grow fast once they're outside. So your, your peas especially and your beans, um, just direct sow them. Once, yeah. once you can get into that, that little bit warmer soil mid-May, your peas can be sown as soon as you can work the soil. Absolutely. What, what else is on that note? Uh, well, peas for sure, they, lo they actually love cold weather. They, they will not succeed when we're seeding them into warm soil. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the earliest things I plant out in the garden. Um, and then, of course, any of our root crops. Root? Any, yeah. So carrots, beets. Anything you're ha harvesting radishes, that actual right? tap root of, like your radishes will get stressed and they'll just go to seed on you. You'll have some great radish tops, but not everybody likes to eat those. Turnips do transplant okay, but that's because if you mess up the root, you still have that globe on top. Yeah. Um, but yeah, things like beets and carrots, uh, if you mess up those roots at all, which is very easy to do when they're delicate, you end up with the funkiest carrots or no carrots at all. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that stuff is, you know, and take advantage of that. The fact that you don't have to start that early indoors mm -hmm. and you, you let mother, yeah, and else. you let mother nature um, actually take care of that for you right mm -hmm. so like all those things that require the cold embrace that because there's no you know unlike the melons and the pumpkins and that we actually don't need warm soil for those guys yeah, yeah, right definitely take potatoes advantage. too are one thing that can be planted uh in cool soil if we get a um uh, a little snap of, of cold once they're planted, they're, they'll still survive. They're mm -hmm. fine. And same as yeah. things as long like... As the ground's not frosty Right, yeah. yeah. And if you don't have much room to start things indoors as well, know that your lettuces, your kales, mm -hmm. all those leafy greens could be started direct seeded outdoors as well. If you wanted to just sow a row of lettuce mm -hmm. as opposed to having to do it indoors or yeah. buy the packs, you can certainly direct seed that because yeah. greens love the cool. Yeah, I'll often like, I'll just start like AC six pack of lettuce so I have one early salad and the rest gets direct sowed every couple weeks because it, it needs to be refreshed yeah. when I harvest it yeah and yeah then you have lettuce all summer absolutely yeah, yeah. okay we just had a whole slew of questions so first Kay. when is it too late to start seeding yeah again too late to start seeding no tomatoes no peppers right now one thing I'll say is on greenlinegarden.com if you go on to services helpful tips there's a ton of tip sheets there and under seeding we have a Calendar. chart on our calendar of on when to start. And mm -hmm. so right now we're really doing things, if you look at the back of the package, of stuff that is four to six weeks out. Mm -hmm. I grow potatoes in plastic tubs where I drilled holes at the bottom. My crop is pretty good, but should I add anything to get more? Uh, so they grew potatoes in a plastic tub and should they got a good crop, should they add anything? The one thing with potatoes is they don't want a really rich soil, mm -hmm. no compost, no manure, because that can lead to scab. Yeah. Maybe some bone meal? Bone meal, a little bit of bone meal. I like sand to loosen up the soil. You'll get bigger tubers, especially if you're okay, using yeah. a heavy soil. And then if you're growing in a tub, start planting your potatoes in the tub half full and hill them in the tub. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. if again, if you go to greenlinegarden.com or in, like, we can even mail you one. We have a, a growth sheet on potatoes and that's one thing that people forget to optimize your harvest when you plant those uh, tubers when you get six to eight inches of growth you cover up the top the bottom two to four inches and you keep hilling and hilling because tomatoes and peppers or sorry potatoes <laughs> are both in that family where they root along the stem mm -hmm. so the more of that stem that you cover with the potatoes the more roots and tubers you get yeah so you really increase your yield of potatoes. For sure. Yeah. Do carrots like warm or cool soil? 
They like cool soil. They germinate better in cool soil. You get those in the ground as early as possible, you will have the best germination. And remember with carrots, when you're seeding, if we have a dry spring, then you do want to ensure that you're keeping that soil moistened daily. Mm -hmm. daily. So not waterlogged, but a good you know, sprinkling of, of water to keep that top layer of soil moist because you get optimum germination with cool, moist temperatures with carrots. Mm -hmm. And beets as well. And beets as well, yeah. yeah. How do you refresh lettuce? How do you refresh lettuce? Some of your lettuces are cut and come, again, varieties, like your heat resistant and bolting resistant. You can just cut them back to where there's just a few leaf left, leaves left and they'll regrow. Others, once, once you cut them back once, like your romaine, usually you cut your romaine heart and it's just going to come back with seeds on you. Right. Uh, so the, like I said, the succession sowing is the best way to have the freshest lettuce. Sow some every two weeks. Yeah, and absolutely. You can, you can even plant it right beside your old lettuce. Yeah. And then when those come out, it just has the space to grow in. Use the row twice. And for a smaller household, romaine, just note that you don't necessarily have to cut like grow like two to three heads of romaine and you don't have to cut the whole head what you can do is continuously harvest the outer leaves yes. and they will keep pushing new growth mm -hmm. so from that inside right so make sure if you just harvest the larger leaves and those two or three heads if you started with those and then planted some more like two three weeks later that's a pretty good amount to get you through a season yeah and you could even sow along the way a little bit of like salad bowl types around the edge just for some interesting for mixing. color and taste yeah. and, and those are ones that often you can cut them and and I have to say okay. lettuces, instead of spending a lot of money at the grocery store on the fancy types, the fancy leafed reds and burgundies, your Spiderman seed racks pack. at your garden yeah. center have an amazing selection of beautiful Merlot is one I'm growing this year. It's burgundy. Jester has speckled leaves. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many lovely blends that you can grow so easily at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so just a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks again for joining us today, guys, and for all the interactive questions. Um, we really appreciate staying connected with you guys right now. Mm -hmm. um, and a reminder that we're still here for you, that though you can't come in and, and wander and hang out with us, the, uh, there's, still, there's lots of seeds available. Potatoes have arrived. Yeah, you we, guys, we even got our fancier potatoes today. The Earth Apples brand came in today. Locally That's, grown Earth Apples, right? Yeah, lots, lots of, of really cool purples and red potatoes and stuff. And I tried most of them last year because I was obsessed with potatoes, and they all grew very well. Wonderful, me, so. yeah. And we love supporting local. And so we're going to get those up on the curbside mm -hmm. uh, website today for everybody to view. Um, and then and we're slowly working on our online store, too. We'll announce that soon for you guys. And remember, you're here for curbside pickup every day, so feel Feel free to email us at gardening at greenlandgarden.com mm -hmm. or call us at 467-7557 and uh, we'd be happy to uh, personally shop for you. One final question. When you add ladybugs to your garden, do they actually stay or they work the bottom? Yeah, yeah, so ladybugs. the ladybugs are fantastic for growing greenhouses because they can't get out. But in your yard, what we say is you need to have a food source there for yeah. them already. So you already want to have aphids. aphids. Yeah. And so you will release the ladybugs so they know that food source is there. But do know that once the food is gone... You know, once the buffet's gone, they're going to the next party. They're going to move on. Yeah, yeah, so some people will put remake cloth over top to kind of keep them around for a few days, right? Mm -hmm. um, and get that, uh, that uh, infestation under control. But do know that eventually you're going to be sharing them with your neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. It was uh, me, Winston, here, and Tina talking about some veggies for you today and answering your great questions. Yeah. I like well, to Perfect. So yeah, it's going to be on Facebook and watch for this as well on YouTube if you wanted to share it with a friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, look for it in the coming weeks. We're going to be doing this uh, uh, every single week. And so be sure to join in.